Good morning, 1045 Crowd at Bay Area Community Church. So glad you're here. If you're watching online, thrilled that you're a part. I want to begin by extending condolences to the mids and uh, the Navy team last year. Sorry, I was, I know we got a few Go Armies out there. Normally I try to be, you know, apolitical when it comes to Army, Navy, but uh, condolences to, to the mids. This morning we continu- continue our series, The King Has Come. And this morning, I want to begin by something that I'm sure you do, most Americans do, we do during the Christmas season, is we watch Christmas movies. And so I want to begin with some congregational participation. If you're online, go ahead and uh, you go ahead and respond to this as well. But what do you think is the number one Christmas movie of all time? Shout it out. I couldn't, I don't, I have no idea what anybody is saying. So, okay, now this is the good housekeeping survey. So it's, you know, it's got to be legit, right? And so I'm going to give you the top five, right? And so coming in at number five in 1965 is a Charlie Brown Christmas. What a, what a classic. Yeah, yeah. And then in the number four slot in 1983, a Christmas story. Okay, we got a few. Coming in at number three on this survey is, and I didn't hear anybody say it, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, a 1989 classic. And then at number two, one of my favorites, it is 1964, Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, right? And the number one, and you probably can guess what is coming, 1946, It's a wonderful life. All right. All right. Now, some of you elf people are wondering, where's elf? Well, again, this is the good housekeeping survey. So I don't think, you know, different demographics are responding to good housekeeping. So it came in at number six. But if you are like me, you will watch It's a Wonderful Life this year. What is it about George Bailey that we love? I will tell you in one word what we love about George Bailey. It is his humility. That humility leads to sacrifice. It leads to service. It leads to considering others more important than himself. What is it about Mr. Potter that we despise? It is the antonym of humility, is it not? It is pride, right? He's selfish, egotistical. All he's worried about is his money, his plan, his agenda. Now, in our culture, humility is a virtue and pride is a vice. Why, even secular books extol the need for humility in leadership, like here's some, good to great, servant leadership, the seven habits of highly effective people, leading change. All of these popular books on leadership will point out the fact that humility is a virtue. But we are in a society that gives honor to the humble. We are in a society that, by and large, looks down on the proud. Now, that's not always the case, but usually. But that was not the way it was in the time of Jesus. As a matter of fact, in the Greco-Roman world, it was humility that was viewed as a vice. Why, humility, the word, is linked to humiliated or humiliation. Thus, to be humble, you were viewed as someone who was humiliated. Why, in their mind, this is an honor-shame culture, and so to be someone of honor, that was to be a bit braggadocious, to bring attention to all of my accomplishments. And to be humble, well, servants, slaves, the meager, they were considered to be humble. It was something that you did not aspire to in the Greco-Roman world. But today, today, by and large, we admire humility. I mean, who wants to follow a proud person, really? We don't really like hanging out with people that are overtly proud. We respect humility. So the question is, how did this word humble 
take on a new meaning in the Western world? Or said another way, how did the word humility become a virtue instead of a vice? The answer, in one word, is Jesus. The life, the birth, the death of Jesus transformed the word humility into a virtue instead of a vice. And it all began at Bethlehem. Now, one thing Aaron said last week is that contrast clarifies, and I like that. At the second coming of Jesus, he will come bursting through the clouds of heaven. He will come riding a white horse. He will come in power and in glory to put down all evil and to judge the world. But at the first coming of Jesus, according to tradition, Mary comes from Nazareth all the way down the 90 miles to Bethlehem. And tradition says she was riding on a donkey. Did you know that the word donkey is used 173 times in the Bible? All right, you can sleep well at night now that you know that, right? As a matter of fact, there is only one other animal in the Bible that is used more frequently than donkey. You want to take a guess? Sheep, yeah, and lamb will count as well for the person who said lamb. Yes, sheep, that's the only animal that is more frequent than the donkey. Well, why would the birth of Jesus be associated with a donkey? It is because a donkey is modest. A donkey is lowly. A donkey is hardworking. Donkeys actually represent humility and service. At Christ's second coming, what is he riding? A white horse. That signifies victory and conquering. At his first coming, he comes on a donkey. That signifies humility. Now, I want us to contrast this morning the majesty and awesomeness of his second coming with the humility of his first coming. And I want to do that by reading two scriptures. The first one is in Revelation chapter 19. If you've been with us, we've read this over the last several weeks. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, it reads like this. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, his name is written, King of Kings. And Lord of lords, riding on a white horse, a symbol of victory. His eyes are aflame. A sword is in his mouth. He has many crowns, many diadems upon his head. He is coming to judge. His name, King of kings, Lord of lords. I want you to think about the first coming in light of his second coming. At Christmas, we celebrate his first coming, not on a white horse, but having traveled the 90 miles in the womb of his mother all the way to Bethlehem on a donkey. Luke records this this way. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, 
to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And now in verse 6 and 7, we read about the birth of Jesus. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for him. The Son of God took on flesh. The Son of God was born. I want you to think about the attributes of God. The attributes of God. For example, who is God? He is self-existent. He is self-sufficient. He is infinite. He is eternal. He is all-powerful. He is all-wise. He is omnipresent. He is sovereign. That's who he is. I want you to think about the characteristics of a newborn. A newborn, and you moms can identify, a newborn is absolutely dependent dependent on everything. A newborn is very weak. An infant is extremely vulnerable. Can you imagine? The God of the universe takes the form of an infant. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but when God created Adam, he created Adam as a fully grown adult. Now, Jesus was never created. If you say that, you've just committed heresy. Jesus is eternal. But Jesus could have appeared as an adult. He didn't have to come as a baby, but he did. I want you to think about where Jesus was born. Where would you expect the king of kings to be born? Well, you would have expected that he would be born in every city, in the city that every king since King David had been born. And that was Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the seat of government, the seat of power, the seat of religion, where the temple was. But instead, he is born in a very obscure little village. It's only written about in the book of Micah. He is born in Bethlehem. What would you expect the accommodations of the king to be? Well, this is a picture of King Herod. And this is King Herod's palace in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And if King Herod was worthy of such a palace, wouldn't you think that Jesus would be deserving of all of the pomp and regalia associated with the king? Yet, we know that Jesus was born in a stable. Better yet, a cave. A cave with the bleeding of sheep, the mooing of cows, the braying of donkeys. A stable is a place that is fit for animals, not a place to give birth. Purity was actually born in the midst of filth. And what would Jesus be wearing at his birth? Well, I've used this analogy before, but it's so good, I'm going to use it again. As for his clothes... I would have thought he would be in this Dolce and Gabbana outfit, right? I mean, something like that, only $515. Or perhaps a nice wool outfit from Burberry, complete with mittens and hat. Instead, the Lord Jesus is wrapped in swaddling cloths. What kind of bed would the king of kings be worthy of? Well, perhaps something like this Corsican crib complete with silk sheets and a goose down comforter, maybe something like that. But rather than a luxurious crib, he was laid 
in a manger. Now, when we think of a manger, we tend to think of a wooden structure. Actually, it wouldn't have been wooden. More than likely, it was stone, hewn. So a manger would be hewn out of stone so it could hold food without dropping it. It could also hold water. So a manger was a trough where animals fed. And I'm sure that Mary did her best to clean it up before putting Jesus in the manger. But perhaps the best way to think about the manger would be that of a pig's trough. Now, I just want you to imagine laying your newborn infant in something like that. You see, the manger and the stable symbolize that the Son of God enters the muck and the mire of our life. As we say frequently around here, He gets in it with us. And to whom would the angels appear? Let's think about that. I can tell you exactly, according to the Jewish mindset, who the heavenly host would have appeared to. It would have been the high priest of Israel. And the high priest would be in Jerusalem at the temple, along with 2,000 other priests who served in the temple. I mean, surely the angelic host would appear to them, but no. As you know, they appear to a group of shepherds. Shepherds? Shepherds were unclean. Do you know why they were viewed as unclean? Because their occupation put them in contact with things that were unclean. Shepherds in an honor-shame culture, they were low on the totem pole. They were viewed as poor and irreligious and unclean, and nobody wanted to hang out with shepherds. The most important event in human history, the angels appear to a band of shepherds. That says something. That says that Jesus is accessible to all. So let's think about this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. Jesus was born in a stable, not a palace. Jesus was laid in a feeding trough, not a crib. The angels appeared to shepherds and not priest. Everything about the birth of Jesus screams humility. Humility. Andrew Murray says this, Christ is the humility of God embodied in human nature. God stoops low. He condescends takes on flesh, and he does so as the greatest act of humility. And here's what I want you to see. At the birth of Jesus, we see a pattern in the life of Jesus that will carry on throughout the life and death of Jesus. It is the pattern of humility. In humility... Jesus is born. In humility, Jesus lives his life. Why, it is in humility that he serves others. In humility, he prays for others. In humility, he has compassion for others. In humility, he heals others. And ultimately, in humility, he dies. That's what Philippians chapter 2 says. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. It is not an accident. It is not an accident that Jesus rides on a donkey on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. The pattern that we see at Bethlehem is the pattern of the life of Jesus. It is the pattern of humility. Now, it is because of Jesus that this word humility, which was disdained in the Greco-Roman rule, 
world actually becomes a word of virtue. And here is the point of the entire message, and so I want you to take this home. The humility of Bethlehem is the pattern of our life, or at least it should be the pattern of our lives, because our lives should be forever shaped by the humility of Jesus at Bethlehem, throughout his whole life, and at his crucifixion. So it is actually this Advent season that we want to meditate on the birth of Jesus, the humility of Jesus, in light of the second coming, in light of the awesome glory and power of his second coming. And when we do that, it's like the incarnation takes on new significance in our life. And so if the humility of Bethlehem is to be the pattern for your life, it begs a question. The question is, how? And this is a question that each and every one of us needs to answer. How am I to embody the humility of Jesus at Bethlehem? This is what all of your children and your grandchildren need to embody. And so I want to give you three um, biblical, practical things to help you embody humility. And I want to remind you that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I want to draw attention to these two words, humbles himself, or it could be humbles herself. In other words, and please, this is very, very important. You and I actually have the responsibility to humble ourselves. That's what that means. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the right time writes the half-brother of Jesus, James. And so you and I are to do something to humble ourselves. Well, well what is it that we can do? And I want to give you three things that we can do. The first thing is this. And you're not going to like these, but here, here they go. <laughs> the first one is this. Take the lowest place. Take the lowest place. Is there not something inside you, certainly is within me, that I actually like to be served rather than serve? I actually like to be first. I want to be first in line. I actually like to have my Christmas dinner served first, right? And Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 2 that in humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. Yes, Yes, you want to be first in line. Yes, you want the best seat. Yes, you want the closest parking spot. But the humble person puts others first. And this was modeled at Bethlehem and all through the life of Jesus. And in particular in John chapter 13, when Jesus gets up from the table, takes off his outer garment, puts a robe around him, takes a basin, and takes the posture of a slave... And washes the feet of the disciples. So this Christmas season, will you humble yourself and choose the lowest place? Now, I don't know what that means for you. Like, for me, it means things like doing the dishes. I really don't like doing the dishes. I like it when Mary Kay does the dishes. I certainly don't like cleaning the bathroom. Really appreciate a clean bathroom, though, right? Whatever your least favorite thing to do is, that's probably the lowest place that you need to go. And maybe for you it means actually giving some thought to gifts this year, to actually giving thoughtful gifts. Maybe it means choosing to be the last person served. Will you humble yourself by taking the lowest place? Now, the second thing 
that we see in the scriptures is you can humble yourself by associating with the lowly. That's the biblical language. In Romans chapter 12, verse 16, it says, Do not be proud, but associate with the lowly. The lowly are the needy, the oppressed, the unpopular, the rejected. And it might be somebody at work, for example. Maybe somebody at work has cancer. Maybe a neighbor might be unemployed. Maybe a friend has lost a loved one. Maybe there's an international person that has no one to spend Christmas with. The proud person says, I'm sorry. I just can't stoop low to do that. I I'm sorry. That's just not who I am, right? Jesus would. Jesus spent time with the outcasts, with the rejected, with those who were grieving and sorrowful. Who is the person that you have the least desire to associate with? Can you think of her or him? I would submit to you that that is the person that Jesus is calling you to humble yourself and spend time with. The third thing and final thing that I want to say is that we humble ourselves when we accept our circumstances. One of the ways that God actually humbles us is through hardships, through unexpected trials and difficulties. Trials keep us humble. They keep us from being self-reliant. Anything that humbles me, that's a good thing. That's what I keep telling myself, right? Why? Because I don't like to be humbled. So I tell myself, anything that humbles me, that is a very good thing. You might be struggling right now with some unexpected hardship or challenge that has come your way. Can I remind you that in the midst of struggle and affliction, the Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He says... My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. That's what the Lord says. And Paul clings to that promise. So you might be lonely. You might have financial struggles. You might be hurting relationally or have health issues. In faith, this Christmas, will you say, Emmanuel... God is with me. So in faith, I receive the circumstances. What is, what is that unexpected circumstance in your life right now? Would you receive it by faith? Would you actually say, thank you, Lord, you're using this to build my faith, to grow my humility? I want to ask you, Think about now, if you took the lowest place this Christmas season, imagine your life if you associated with the lowly, imagine how you would change if you accepted your circumstances. Why, you would actually be living out the pattern of Bethlehem. You would be growing in humility, and you know what would happen to you? You would experience peace. You would experience joy. You would be blessed. That's what Jesus says. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. He who humbles himself, says Jesus, will be exalted. Now, I want you to imagine if you choose not to live out the pattern of Bethlehem, do you know what you would miss? You would miss Jesus. Because Jesus is in the low places. Jesus is with you when you associate with the lowly and you experience supernaturally the presence of Jesus 
in the midst of your difficult circumstances when you trust him. God is saying to us, the humility of Bethlehem is actually the pattern for our life. It is actually the pathway of blessing. We admire George Bailey, don't we? And George actually teaches us something. Humility does lead to a wonderful life. But it's not a life without trials and hardships and difficulties. Here's what I learned from George Bailey. George's humility actually elicits a response from others. Because George was humble, he could put others ahead of himself. Because George modeled humility, George was generous. He was sacrificial. And he was impacting all those around him. It resulted in eliciting a powerful response. Jesus is the most humble, is he not? And the life of Jesus... The humility of Bethlehem ought to elicit a response from you, a response from me. The only question is, will I respond? Father, I pray for each and every one of us that we would leave here today, those who are watching online here in the auditorium, that we would leave here today with a deeper appreciation of the incarnation, the condescension, the humility of Jesus, the pattern of Bethlehem that is to be the pattern for our life. And so, Lord, would we take the lowest place? Would we associate with the lowly? Would we accept whatever hardships and difficulties come our way knowing that this was the pattern of Jesus and that you will bless us. We say thank you, Jesus. We commit ourselves afresh to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, now to him who humbled himself at Bethlehem and at Calvary, may we commit ourselves to following his pattern. God bless you all. We will see you next week. <laughs>